So when you think of fine wines, if you think of wine at all, perhaps your mind and palate goes to a certain region of France. Because France has, been, have a, has a long history of wine making and wine drinking, which may be why they've never won a war without the help of another nation, but that's a different issue here. France is known for its wines, and the various wines that we have are really known from the various regions of France. So places like Champagne, Bordeaux, um, Chablis, Chardonnay, Beaujolais, Burgundy. Those are all various regions of France that gives the name to various varieties of wines that we have available to us. So the stuff that the baseball players and the World Series spray on each other after the World Series victory, they may call it champagne, but if it's not from the region of, French, of Champagne, it's really just sparkling wine. But while the French may be the quintessential wine snobs, the more adventurous wine makers are branching out, so to speak, and moving to Napa to try and experiment with them in this more freewheeling uh, vineyards and wine industry that we have here in the United States. One of the winemakers, Philippe Melka, puts it this way. He says, here you have more options and here you have an excitement about trying new things. Nicholas Morlay, uh, uh, who descends from a long history of uh, champagne makers, agrees with him. He says that it's completely different here. We have the freedom to fully realize our passion and to push the limits. We're not working under a classification made in 1855 or the constitution of Grand Cru, which in French is great growth. But still, there are some things about winemaking that are inviolable. The, if, whether it be old world or new world wine, this is a truth. Good wine, great wine, is always a reflection of the vineyard. Let me say that again. Great wine is always a reflection of a particular vineyard. If you want to know whether the wine's good or not, look at the source. Now, Jesus knew a few things about wine himself. I mean, considering the number of parties that he attended in the New Testament, and of course, how he blew the minds of the guests at the wedding of Canaan with the wine that he created for them. So it shouldn't be a surprise to us that he uses the metaphor of a vineyard to describe the relationship between him and his disciples, both his original disciples and his people of faith today. Jesus knew that the best way to tell what kind of product you're getting is to look at the label and find what vineyard it came from. In this case... The source is not a place, but a person. Some FAQs that, about Jesus' teaching in John 15. Jesus is the vine. He begins by telling us that he is the true vine, the source of growth and fruit bearing in a vineyard that is tended by the Father. So that makes God the, vi the winemaker, the vine dresser. The creator God is the one who makes sure of the vineyard's quality and that it is a good vineyard. Now, what we also learn is that this vineyard has quite a history behind it. The metaphor of a vineyard for being God's people starts way back in the Old Testament. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, it talks about God planting a vineyard and tending the vineyard, but that only those vines, those grape vines within the vineyard would only produce wild grapes, inferior fruit, which was a metaphor for the disobedience of Israel and Judah. 
Other places within the Old Testament, you find this vineyard metaphor is uh, Jeremiah 2, um, in Ezekiel 19, and in Hosea 10. Each of those places, places talk about the vineyard being a metaphor for God's people. But back then, the vine was Israel. And Israel just wasn't producing good grapes because Israel wasn't connected to the source of nourishment. If Israel had been connected to the true source of nourishment, its grapes would have been fine, just like today. If you have a good source of nourishment for the grapevines, your grapevines will produce good grapes. It's what grapevines do. That being said, it was the vine dresser's responsibility then to prune and cut out what was not being which was not producing fruit and if necessary to replace it the pruning and replacing is what the prophets talked about as happening during the exile of Israel in um, Assyria and in Babylon God would eventually though replace the vineyard with a new stock a new vine the true vine. Jesus himself embodies the new Israel in becoming the true vine, God's chosen one, the one through whom the whole world would be saved and blessed. And while the vine is the source of the good fruit, there's a link, a vital link, between the vine and the fruit. Thus, the branches are really the focus of what Jesus was talking about in this gospel lesson. He says, I am the vine, and then to his followers, you are the branches. Notice that Jesus didn't say that his disciples are the fruit, the end product. He says they are the conduit of the vine's nourishment. Similarly, our conversion, becoming people of God's kingdom, isn't the end product. We are brought into God's kingdom for an even greater purpose, to bear fruit. And the quality of the fruit depends on our connectedness to the vine. What Jesus is describing here is that necessary interrelationship between himself and his disciples, a relationship that is characterized by abiding, indwelling, mutuality, but one that is focused on bearing grand cru, great growth for God's kingdom. If you look at a grapevine, one of the first things you'll notice is how the branches kind of twist and turn about, and it's very difficult to separate out one from another individually. All the branches twist and curl about one another to the point you can't tell where one begins and the other one ends. Jesus uses that branch metaphor, that imagery, as a way of expressing that it's not about the achievement of the branch or what it produces. When it comes to discipleship, each branch, each individual redirects their desires and wants, their likes and dislikes, to be, in order to become one of the surrounding, supporting, encircling branches. A community that supports and is nurtured by Christ and points to Christ's reputation and Christ's quality, not its own. So understanding the interrelationship and connectedness of the branch then leads us who are the vine or the branches, the, the conduits, it, there's a couple of points that we need to keep in mind as we work and are connected to the vine to produce fruit. The first thing that we need to remember is that branches are fruit bearing, not 
fruit making. Jesus says, just as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. We've heard these words of Jesus quite often, many times, but we also are in this call of culture that calls us to workaholism, to achievement, to excess, to success. Many are the person that you find examples in this world of people who have been successful, who have who've climbed the executive ladder, who's built a business for themselves, or been the best homemaker possible, the best husband, the best possible father, and they come crashing down because they're no longer intimately connected to Jesus. You see, when the branch gets the idea that it can produce fruit on its own without the help of the vine, it dries up and withers and is no longer useful. You see, the mission of the branch is not to point to itself, to make itself look good, to call attention to itself. The mission of the branch is to give glory to God, the one whose name is on the label. Secondly, the fruit that we bear then, like grapes, has many textures and flavors. Paul outlines this in Galatians when he talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. A more general way to talk about the um, gifts of the Spirit or the, the fruit of the Spirit that we bear, though, might be to talk about it in the graces that we have. As a branch connected to and abiding in the source of God's love and grace, we are conduits and not the end product. You see, God's grace and love come to us and pass through us as it goes on to someone else. If we're not forgiving as God is forgiving us, we're stopping that conduit and not being a conduit of grace. If we're hanging on to um, hard feelings and um, pride and hurt, then we're no longer bearing the fruit and we've blocked the flow of grace and prevent God from producing fruit from within us. So the question becomes, how do we stay connected? Connected to the true vine. Scripture's pretty blunt about this. It doesn't give us any much wiggle room here. The best way to stay connected to the vine is through worship. Being here. You don't worship because it's your duty or to check something off your weekly list. God isn't impressed by you showing up to worship. It's called a worship service not because we're coming here to serve God, but because God comes to serve us. We always approach God as beggars, laden with guilt and sin. And God comes to us through his word and through the sacraments to forgive our sins, to change our minds, to strengthen us, to bear fruit in his kingdom. We're always beggars before the throne of God. Bearing fruit, then, is sort of a sign of us being connected to the vine. It demonstrates whether we're being a conduit or whether we're blocking off that flow of God's grace. When we serve our neighbor as ourselves, the love and grace of God flows through us and bears fruit in the world. You see, it's not God who needs our works. Our neighbor needs our works. And those works then 
are an expression of our connectedness to the true vine. And this is where Jesus' talk of pruning comes in then. Cutting off that which is not working, which is not bearing fruit, but even that which does bear fruit, pruning it up so it bears even more fruit in our lives. See, one of the things about grapevines is that they grow aggressively. The stems and twigs and, that, and leaves just grow all over the place. And unless you stop that growth, it can bleed off a lot of the nourishment that would be put into producing the fruit. God does that to us, sometimes in ways that we do not like at all in our lives. I mean, who likes to be cut on, to be pruned? But God does that so that we don't get caught up in all these peripheral and side issues and forget about the main thing. And the main thing is to share God's love in Jesus Christ by what we say and by what we do. So here's the point of Jesus' teaching then. Just as a great wine is a reflection of a particular vineyard, so the branch and the fruit it bears is the reflection of our connectedness to the true vine. God is the ultimate vine dresser, and in his vineyard is the church. And through the church, God creates great growth. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The channels through which God's grace flows out into the world. So that when the world samples the grace and goodness of God's love and mercy, they too will want to know who the winemaker is. And that's when we point them to Jesus, to God, our Creator, our Redeemer. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.